Hello, everybody. Happy Monday morning. Hope yours is going well. We've got another Seahawks video to get to today, but first, we just hit 4,130 subscribers to the channel. I want to give a shout out to all the subscribers. And special tip of the cap goes to the channel members, especially elite channel members Brandon McKell, Hasher for MVP, Salacious Crumb, Rye Guy, Brendan Nelson's Haircut, VGK Tigers, It's Hoof, The Reno, TVO, Austin Roberts, Scott Todd, PH Glass, Aaron Garrett, Arfman, Twelfth Man, Eli Bennett, Cassio Feria, Samoan, and JoJo. All right, rookie minicamp is over. And we are about a week away from the start of OTAs. And whether or not OTAs will be interesting for the Seahawks is a question that remains to be answered. We know that a lot of our players will not be attending. In fact, most of them may not be attending. But that will be the next time we have an opportunity to get any real news about what these players are doing or not doing on the field. So we have a little bit of time to kill. So I decided I would go ahead and start a new series of videos. This is going to be a seven-part series, one video a day for the next week, where I discuss players that the Seahawks front office have made a bet on that will either pay out or not pay out this year in all likelihood. So there are things this front office has done that are clearly just great, right? Like the DK Metcalf pick. Even if DK Metcalf doesn't play great this year, nobody will go out and say, oh, this front office really screwed up by drafting DK Metcalf. Not, not at this point, because he's played so well the last couple of years. He's clearly an elite player. And even if he never gets to the Hall of Fame heights that some people are talking about with him, he's clearly a player that you would be thrilled to get in the bottom end of the second round. And this is not about the Rashad Penny draft picks of the world. Those picks are already bad. Those picks are already, it's a, basically a sunk cost at this point. At this point, even if he goes out there and has a really good year, then it's not worth that much because it just means he's going to sign a big contract somewhere else next year. So this video series is going to look at the guys who are entering something of a make or break season and their success or lack of success this year on the field will go a long way towards determining if this front office is hitting the right spots. Are they zigging when they should zig or are they zigging when they should zag? So we're going to go through seven players and we're going to start today with a certain third year defensive lineman. Okay, I'm talking about LJ Collier. He is entering his third year with the Seahawks. He is about to turn. In fact, right before the season starts, he will be turning 26. He was a late first-round pick in 2019. And a lot hangs in the balance, not only for this season, but for this front office's credibility on whether or not he can up his game significantly. So let's look at LJ Collier so far in his career. Uh, first year was just a complete waste. Three tackles in 11 games. He barely played. Uh, the injury really kind of boned him out of whatever he maybe would have been able to do in uh, 2019. 2020, he played a full season, made some plays, three sacks, two pass deflections, 22 tackles, four for a loss, uh, 17 hits on the quarterback, I believe. Yes, 17 hits on the quarterback, only one missed tackle. Okay, he's headed in the right direction. But these are not necessarily the numbers that you would expect from a guy you spend a first-round pick on, right? These are stats you might expect from somebody like uh, Alton Robinson, who you got in the fifth round. These are stats you might expect from a UDFA type, who you just put out there because you don't have anybody else better. Uh, his PFF grade is not terrible, but it's not good. 59.1 marks him as a player who belongs in the NFL, but doesn't say much more about him than that. And... All that might be fine were it not for the fact that he was a late first round pick. And let's talk about that a little bit because that's going to kind of go into why this is such an important season for LJ Collier. Because even though we know he's going to be on the team in 2022 because he'll still be under contract, if he does not show out this year, then there will be practically no faith in him going forward. Uh, most people, myself included, will just assume, okay, that's another bust. Let's just uh, move on. Let's just uh, run out the rest of his rookie deal if we have to, but we're not getting anything from this guy. Let's just move on to the next guy. He's he's He doesn't cut it. He's a warm body who can occasionally make a play, but people are going to be like, all right, 
it's time to move on. So here's the thing with LJ Collier. When we drafted him number 29 overall in the 2019 draft, we knew, we knew that he was a reach. I, maybe the team didn't want to admit it, but the team had to know that he was not expected to be a first round pick. He was expected to be an early second round pick. So they reached. And not only did they reach to get LJ Collier, they traded down. They had the 21st pick in the draft this year, right here, this slot right here. They traded down with the Green Bay Packers in a trade where they lost by virtue, by in, in terms of pure pick value and got LJ Collier. Now, there are two players that I want to highlight here. The first is the guy the Packers got when they traded with us. That was Darnell Savage, the free safety from Maryland. And the second player is Montez Sweat from Mississippi State, the defensive end. Now, before I jump into this, I understand that playing this game will drive any fan absolutely insane. I understand that. And you don't want to play this game of, oh, we could have drafted this guy, but we drafted that guy. Every team does that. Every team can do that. You don't want to be playing this game all that often because it'll it'll drive you insane. And that that's not good for anybody. Nobody wants to be driven insane. However, I want to take a look at the impact and the level of play that these two players have had because... Clearly, these are two players that we could have selected at our pick at number 21. We could have not traded down. We could have just taken Savage, could have just taken Sweat. Those are the two guys. So Darnell Savage has been a really nice free safety for the Packers since he got there. He's played in 29 of 32 games. He has six career interceptions, 17 pass deflections, uh, 130 total tackles, four for a loss. Uh, he's got a sack. He's been the... Um, last line of defense on a defense that has been pretty good the last two years. At least it's been good enough for them to win almost every game they played. And yeah, you would say that that was a successful pick and that Darnell Savage has proven himself to be a quality player in the NFL so far. And look, I'll say this. It kind of worked out because we didn't get Darnell Savage, but a few months later we traded far fewer assets for Quandre Diggs, and Quandre Diggs has been awesome for us. Okay, I'll give you that. So maybe this worked out. Uh, his PFF grade, by the way, last year was 75.3, which is very good. Uh, borderline great, actually. It might even be straight up great. But yeah, Darnell Savage has been a nice safety. However, I will grant you that maybe it worked out because we were able to trade a fifth round pick for a safety who's been great for us as well, a free safety who's been really great for us. But there's no getting around it. We messed up bad on the Montez Sweat thing. Let's take a look at this. Two years in Washington, played in every game. He's got 16 sacks, eight pass deflections, four forced fumbles, almost 100 tackles, 20 tackles for loss. This dude is a monster. Almost 60 QB pressures, okay? This is the guy that we could have had, but instead decided to get LJ Collier. And I understand that he was technically picked right before we could pick, but we traded down. So we could have just taken sweat and laughed our way to the bank. No, we didn't laugh our way to the bank. We laughed our way to LJ Collier. Look at this. Almost 60 pressures in the last two years. And this is competing with guys like Ryan Kerrigan. And last year he had Chase Young and Deron Payne and... The, some of the best defensive linemen in the league, some of the best pass rushers in the league. So I know he has good help around him, but by that same token, it's not the easiest thing in the world to get a ton of stats when you're competing for your stats with other players who are elite at getting after the QB. His PFF grade, by the way, 79.7. So that marks him as one of the best edge rushers in the league. Yeah. LJ Collier has big boots to fill, and right now he's he's not filling them. And again, I understand. You can't play this, oh, we could have drafted this guy, but we drafted that guy game, or else you're going to go crazy. But bottom line is, the Seahawks made the LJ Collier pick at a time when they desperately needed pass rush. The reason why, the reason why we traded for Clowney before the season started was because we didn't feel like we had pass rush. The reason why we traded for Carlos Dunlap in the middle of the season last year was because we didn't have a pass rush. And I think if we had Montez Sweat these last two years, that may have not been a thing. We might have been pretty damn happy with our pass rush. 
We might have been able to not go get Jadavion Clowney. We might have been able to not trade for Dunlap. Not that, not that that was a bad trade by any stretch of the imaginations, but the deficiencies on this defense the last two years largely come back to the decision to trade back, get LJ Collier, and let Montez Sweat go to the now football team. So here's what I'm going to say about LJ Collier. This is his third year in the league. Uh, his first year was a red shirt, so whatever, scratch it off. But it's time. It's time for him to start justifying his first round draft grade. It's time for him to start giving us something for putting the belief in him to reach for him in the bottom end of the first round. And here's what I want to see from LJ Collier this year. Uh, first, I don't think he's going to play as many snaps this year, even if he plays all 16 games. He probably won't because we have a deeper rotation on our defensive line this year. However, I want to see, in whatever snaps Collier ends up getting, I want to see something around what we got from Jerron Reed in 2020, okay? So Jerron Reed, this is kind of the guy he might be replacing, because when you think about it, Jerron Reed got cut, and I know that as of right now, Collier is listed as a end, but a lot of people, myself included, expect him to move to tackle and become a three-tech. So... Assuming that happens, then Collier kind of becomes the Reed replacement. So if you look at what Reed did last year, he played in all 16 games, six and a half sacks, almost 40 tackles, five tackles for loss, 14 hits on the quarterback, and 22 QB pressures. It was a pretty good season. He came alive after Dunlap got here. Well, Dunlap is still here, so that's certainly not an excuse this year. So 22 QB pressures in over 800 snaps for Reed. Obviously, Collier won't play anywhere near that many snaps unless something goes terribly wrong. But he will play snaps. I would say, as of right now, around 500 snaps. Especially if Alden Smith doesn't play this year, he might even play a few more. So, give me what Reed gave us last year. About 6.5 sacks and 22 to 24 QB pressures. Somewhere between 20 to 25, let's say. So somewhere between six to eight sacks and somewhere between 20 to 25 QB pressures. That's what I need to see in this make or break year for LJ Collier for him to start justifying the faith that this front office put into him when they picked him in the first round in 2019. So that's the standard for me. Again, I'll say it again. Just pressure the quarterback, six to eight sacks, 20 to 25 QB pressures. I don't need you to be Aaron Donald, but I need you to be that. And that's going to do it for me. This was part one of what will be a seven-part series where I take a look at some of the most important players for the Seahawks in 2021. Let me know what you think in the comments. See you guys possibly later today if I decide to make another video. If not, I will see you guys tomorrow with part two of this series. Peace out. Go Hawks. See you guys in stream later. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think.